IMT. And I am here to work with Elmer to give us an introduction and um, an application to how to use the machine. Um, Thank you very much, yeah. uh, So I think the, uh, the, so everyone here speaks English? All right, that's very good. This makes my life easier. Otherwise, I have to do it in French or German, but this is better to do in English. Um, yeah, so as already said by uh, Elena, so my, my, my goal here is really to give you an introduction uh, on a technology which is called HCS for high content screening. So a lot of people don't know uh, high content screening, but you all guys know uh, microscopy. And therefore, this is just a complementary uh, technology which is called uh, HCS, and which I'm going to introduce here. And I'll also take the same uh, occasion to uh, talk about um, systems that Joaquin Helmer is uh, basically proposing. That's the uh, kind of PPP, purpose the process and payoff of this session. So, introduction of Joaquin uh, Helmer Global Solution for High Content Screening. Uh, doing a short introduction in the technology here, describing the type of system that we have, and uh, giving some real case examples on applications, so to give you ideas about what you can do. And the payoff is that you will have a clearer understanding of what we do, and uh, I'll also have a better understanding of your applications. If you have any question during this talk, just stop me, and then don't just raise your hand, and then just to make it interactive, and so that you really can uh, benefit of um, what we do today. So, as an agenda, we will just cover what is HCS, uh, the definition, so why do researchers use this technology here, and uh, what do we offer as a solution, and then last part is the application. So first one is what is HCS? So you can Google these uh, three letters in the uh, in internet, and you will find maybe 100 or even 200 definitions. But one of the most common uh, use definition is um, automated microscope to capture images from the multi-ray well plate and analyze one or more parameters. Right? So the first part is comparable to what you would do on a con conventional microscope. But the second part is actually where the difference will come from. Now, you cannot talk about HCS without two other options. So the first one is HCA for high content analysis. So basically analysis of um, images coming from this type of readers, and also MPA, because HCA is multi-parametric by nature. So, and that's actually where the difference will, make, will, will, uh, will, will, will come from. Now, usually this system, HCS, and this software, usually it's a, a software which is doing it, they come together, right? And that's the main difference. Uh, and on, for multi-parametric analysis, you really need to have, um, there are some requirements like the database to easily retrieve your information, but also the, uh, like the data mining part, so basically how to extract information out of the images. I'll give you a real example. So if we take this example here, where we have a 96 word plate with two uh, staining, there's one DAPI in blue for the eye, and the other one GFP, uh, this is the GPCR assay, okay? So if you read this plate on a normal microplate reader, then you will end up with 96 times two data points. Intensity of DAPI, intensity of uh, GFP. That's what you typically have on a plate reader. If you read the same uh, plate in the operator type of device, the one which is now in the basement, then you see here for the first label, for instance, we can extract information about morphology, like the morphology of my, of my nuclear population here. Uh, the shape, the roundness, the area, uh, the uh, granularity of, 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 the, of, of this object, you can have it. And on top of that, you have some intensity, and not only the mean, you have max, minimum, uh, you, have, uh, you can get like uh, remember, uh, CV, uh, SD, uh, contrast, so a lot of information, parameters which are related to information. And on top of that, you also extract texture information. And texture is like a new set of filters that we use now more and more in our HCS. And that's only for the first level. And you get something similar for the second level. And we can also get information on a uh, label free, so without any uh, intensity of fluorescence uh, state. Right? So as for now, just for this example, you will end up with 10 times more data. And this is typically the reason why you need to have 
a very good software actually to handle all this data, the information. When you, when you say label free, you mean transmitted light? No, or a, no, stainless, I'll call it stainless. Stainless but fluorescent? Yes. Autofluorescent? Uh, no, so it's bright field, so it's white, white light, yeah. not fluorescent, it's just white light. Right? So it's not the same as the like impedance measurement that like you have. Like you, there are some devices which are doing real label free. That's not that one. Right? But it's just like reading sure. cell morphology, cell intensity without uh, fluorescence. You do it with a white light. But it's like normal microscope. Good pleasure. So your final readout at the end will be what we have here. So typically this is a we call it screening. I don't like this name because you can also use this machine not for screening but for assay development and this for your own uh, biological research. So this is an example where we tested uh, compounds from a library which is called LOPA. Uh, so it's a very uh, small library with very active compound. That's why we, you know, it's a very small one. 1,280 compounds in total. We were looking at the uh, Utah Hydroenergic Receptor. Um, and then what we have here, this is the profile of our positive control, the brown one. And we look at the behavior of this control, the isoprotelenol, looking at in here we have, I think, 12 or 14 parameters. So every single point here is one parameter. So we look at the profile of one positive control. And out of these 1,280 compounds, we wanted to know which compound have a similar behavior than our positive control. And this is what we call usually hits, because these compounds can be uh, later on uh, drugs. Right? We call them hits. And that's typically where you end up when you use this technology here. So instead of comparing these compounds using only one point, for instance, this one, intensity, we really look at the profile. And that's the final readout. Right. That's the main difference. Now, uh, from what I see in the, uh, in the field, um, what, what do researchers uh, uh, request actually for uh, this technology, HGS? So the first uh, parameter is actually the flexibility. So typically to be able to work with different type of models, uh, so we know these mammalian cells, but now we see more and more also demand on yeast or even whole organisms because this is becoming very, very uh, famous now, uh, zebra fish and uh, CLIS. But there are also people using it in plant biology, you see, right? or even for seeds, right? because it's just like a microscope technique. Uh, the other requirement is for plates, so to be able to work with different plate format, going from 6 square plate to 1536. Format, but also this color slip and slice. And that's that uh, Of course, low instrument, that's the, uh, the side. But the other reason is actually speed and reproducibility. Because the system is fully automated, so once you define your protocol for acquisition, then it will just run it over the time, and you have much less uh, like standard uh, SD if you compare it to manual scoring. This is really reproducible. Um, so as I already said, the powerful data management and data, data mining software is really needed here to, uh, to make your, your decisions. So now what do we offer as a like, solution? So Perkinano, for people who don't know it, is an American company which basically is offering different type of uh, instruments. So we have some uh, instruments for, uh, we just call them MMD, so multi-plate readers. Uh, we also have like, a set of instruments in, um, in uh, microfluidics. So I'm not covering this, this, this part here. We, hope we have another department which, which is only for uh, liquid handling and robotic. So basically starting from simple stations like the Janus here or Zephyr, um, up to the cell explorers, which is a fully automated system with imagers, readers, uh, <laughs> liquid handling uh, preparation. You know, so this is a very fully automated uh, system. And this is the part where I'm actually working on. So uh, cellular imaging, uh, and tissue imaging. So for the tissue, we have these two systems, so Vectra and Mantra, uh, which I will not cover because that's not my, my product portfolio, but I'm actually located in this part here. So Operetta and Opera, uh, Phoenix, and together with the Columbus for data management. And we have launched actually another multi-plate reader, so it's called Insight. So it's uh, actually this system, Envision, plus uh, some imaging capability. Right? That's actually what we have. But the strategy of the company during the last uh, five or six years uh, was to basically uh, acquire different companies, different pieces of companies, to offer a global solution for imaging. So basically going from the cell level, wild animal, up to human level, we can now propose one uh, imaging solution at every single step. 
So for the cell level, we have the triangular nebulosity uh, actually in this part here, at the well level. So we also have like images for in vivo systems. And uh, now we are also commercializing some human uh, agents. Right? And Columbus is really our central repository and data management, data mining software we offer. And I will come to that later on. So this is the global solution for high content screening. What we have here is Columbus in the center, and we have two devices now, Operator and Opera, both controlled with the same software, which is called Omni. And we have here a kind of a standard microscope, confocal microscope, uh, with a 3D, very nice 3D software for image analysis and also image, uh, image uh, data visualization. Right? So I'll just start with the Operator. So that's the machine we have here downstairs. Um, so it's an automated um, imager which can work in confocal or wide field. And it, uh, the user can select the optical mode from the software, right? And you can move vice versa. And um, so physicists would probably not like it because it's a closed box, but it's not a microscope in the box, but you have all the different components inside. Now, when you look inside the box, um, so you can have, for instance, this is the, uh, the, the excitation. Uh, we use a lamp, xenon lamp. Uh, which will give like the different wavelength for excitation. Um, then you, we have a set of filters, so excitation, dipole, and emission filter. So these two filters will allow you to select the band, excite your compound here. Then uh, the excitation light will go through this uh, spinning disk. So that's a spinning disk confocal that we use here to your sample, which is here. And then the emission will actually come back and will be measured on the camera. Right. It's a, just like the same part as a uh, microscope, standard microscope. But what we have here um, is the, um, there's another system for autofocus. So this will just find the sample automatically. So because it's automatic, you don't have to say, you know, to move anything. So this is a system autofocus database which will just find uh, the, uh, the sample for you. You can put up to four different objectives at the same time in the machine, and you can choose them from 200x to 100x. Uh, next to that, the transmission light uh, is another light source, which is just here for uh, bright field illumination for people who are interested in uh, cell morphology without any state. Right? So um, we, there are some nice features like um, so barcoded filters, but also objectives. So this is just in multi-user environment. So if your colleague removes something from the machine like objective or filter without telling you, you will not be able to use those parts because you have to, if they are not in the system, the system will not allow you to use them to, to minimize the errors. Right, so we use this uh, barcode and filter as an objective. Uh, there is a live cell chamber here for um, time-lapse acquisition. So if you want to repeat your measurement over the time, you can control the CO2 and the temperature here. And then the system can just keep going. Uh, I've done a measurement uh, to four days, it was fine. Uh, the software actually is called Harmony and has a very, uh, how to say, workflow oriented uh, design. So you can set up your measurement here, you can run it, you can do the image analysis and then also look at the results of the analysis. And all is done in the same software. And now we use another uh, way for the analysis which is called phenology, but that's something you're probably going to look at later on. It's just a machine learning uh, concept. So you teach the software how to recognize the phenotype that you're interested in, and then the software will do it later on. So it's much easier than what we usually do. Um, so what we have, this is the other system. I will not cover it. It's a system which was launched in last year, so January 2014, and we just started to sell it since September. So it's a different concept with lasers for excitation. We, it has like four cameras. You can look at the four channels in parallel, and we also use a uh, so-called synchrony optics, so it's a way to basically remove out uh, lead to, from one channel to the other one, right? Um, which is uh, patented actually by Burkina. So it's double disc uh, synchrony optics. Right? And on top of that, we also have water immersion lenses, which is not the case, because in the operator, all the lenses are dry objectives and one camera, and lamp for excitation. How many objectives are on your parareta? We have three actually now. We have 10x, not 2x, 10x, 20x. And I have actually both with me the 40x. I have this project with me. So that uh, you can just sit and see. But they are technically from 2x to 100x. And you can replace them easily. 
Um, so this is the Columbus. I just added this uh, slides just before we start now because I think it might be interesting in an environment where you have confocal microscopes, other images, and also a predator. So Columbus is a server-based storage and image analysis that we also offer. So how it works? So you can install it on your own server, or we can actually give you the server, which sits next to the machine, with a capacity going from 8 terabytes to uh, 10 terabytes. And what happens here is you can store images in the server. You can, look it, uh, you can use it to look at your existing data via the web interface. So Internet uh, Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, or whatever. And you can actually use it to analyze images coming from your existing microscopes also to compare different data, right? So it's compatible with all the others. Yes, yeah. it's using this uh, OME. I don't know if someone knows it already. Open Microscopy Environment Concept. So basically, all the different providers of microscope, like uh, Zeiss, uh, Olympus, us, mm -hmm. so all the different providers, if you generate a new format, you have to send it to OME, and OME will actually put it in the database. Right? It's kind of conventional, because otherwise, for researchers, it's very difficult. You know, we have a or 20. But the way it works is, just using Internet Explorer, you see here, you can actually, you have your database, you can put microscope type of data, but also high content screening type of data. Uh, this is the microscope type, this one as well, this one as well, and then this is uh, HCS now type of data, which you have here. So I can browse to different type of images, I can bring the analysis using the concept which is coming from Acapella, uh, which is very flexible actually, so it gives more flexibility than Nikon uh, or Zeiss or whatever. And it's really compatible with different types of so multi-channel sets that time series. So it's very, very easy. And the reason why you would use this is because at the end that's what you do. I said that the, mach the machine is going to give you a lot of information if you need it. We can output 1,700 parameters for every single cell. So it's a lot. If you need it. Otherwise, the basic standard would be 20 to 25 parameters. Right? But if you need it, you can generate a lot of information. Now, if you generate a lot of information, you have to handle those information. Otherwise, you can be completely uh, messed up. And that's actually what this software will do. So out of this region, you can just browse and then find uh, the middle information. That's the, that's the end of it. That's the Columbus, so the different format, which uh, this is from 2009. So you have different format already, which are here. Uh, so in all this uh, format, which you can be just inside. Now, some starting from the applications here, we have uh, launched, so the version you have here is 3.5. Um, and last week, we launched the 4.1. So and we don't want to include the new features, but so we are always developing. Every year, we have a big release with new features, which comes actually out This was from last year, and the one from this year, we haven't included here. But I just want to show you some nice features that we have here on the new software, starting from uh, phase contrast, but digital face contrast, not the, uh, the hardware face contrast, um, it, which, which are all software related. Single cell data and flat field collection, but also the automatic transfer uh, of images into uh, Columbus. So you see here, um, for the flat field collection, I'm showing two images here. On the top, there is no flat field collection. And in the bottom here, we have a bright uh, flat field. And the flat field you see here, this bright uh, center here, the background, is just a way to correct it. So if you have assays with floating cells, lymphocytes, for instance, or black cells, if you have um, assays, for instance, where you are looking at toxicity, you don't want to wash too much, because if you wash, then you remove the dead cells, right? So in this that case, for instance, you might end up in this situation. So what happens is the software can just um, correct this for you using this FFC, but the originality here is that the reference images, so the images which will be used for this correction, will come from the plate itself. So during the measurement, the software will do it in the background to determine these uh, reference images, and we'll just do the correction. So that's much better than what, we, what we've seen so far. Um, so this is just an example of this image. If you take the whole image, then you are actually in this um, situation. If you only take the sensor here, minus 60, then you are in this situation. And the flash field can actually basically minimize this variation from the edge to the center of the image. Another option is the digital phase contrast. So it's not a, a, a hardware phase, 
But this one actually is based on the bright field images. So it's a concept which takes two images, so the one in the upper plane, one in the lower plane, and then we generate one phase contrast image, which is digital, and which you can use now to look at intensity. Right? So typically in this case, I can count the cells, I can look at the cell morphology, I can look at the coherency without any stain. Right? And that's something you can add to any uh, measure. This is just to show the differences between digital phase and QRSS images. So it's a segmentation, so it's as good or even better in some cases compared to QRSS by far. Right? And that's just like to correlate these numbers like cell counting or confluency using the two techniques, so it's, it's pretty, it's pretty easy. You know, to personalize. Cell tracking, so that's something that we can now use on the um, digital phase channel, but also in QRSS as before. And cell tracking, you could, you could uh, see it, for instance, in chemokinesis, uh, chemotaxis, but also cell cycle. Uh, I have an example downstairs if you want to look at it later on. Uh, or for any dynamic uh, process in the cell. So if you want to measure the cell every five minutes, every half an hour, and then see like uh, variation over time, that's something you could, you could do. So that's the way it works on the software, which is here. So I'm just showing here two wells. So one well in which the cells are moving, and the other one the cells. Uh, the movement is kind of inhibited, so so you can see here, you can just repeat the measurement like over the time, and the uh, green plot here is the first generation, and if you have a red, so this one is now in mitosis, this one will first round up, and then go with two daughters, and then you can actually follow them. So it's possible to see when the cell will divide, if it is synchronous, synchronous. Uh, if you add like, if you have a treatment which is going to impact this cell division, and that's something you can also follow. Uh, last but not least, you can also look at the uh, so at time time like at the end of your measurement, the end point, you can actually relate it back to the like the original cell. Um, like for instance, this is the parents, first generation, second generation, third, etc. Because for this cell, still you get the information from this one. Uh, so this is for tracking and back back tracking. This is another example with the cell tracking, which is quite nice. Just showing like all the cells, so you can track the cells, look at the speed of the cell, the displacement in X in Y, and whatever. And the relocation of the stage is very good. Uh, could I just ask how, how fast can you take these pictures? Uh, how fast? What do you mean how fast? I mean, how many can you take? Uh, at so, one form? Is it every minute? Uh, so this example here was every five or every ten minutes. Okay. So it depends on your on the, on the number of wells you have selected. Right? But this is, I think it's every 10 minutes, okay. over like 48 hours. But can you do it faster? Uh, faster, so I think the fastest one you can do on this system would be about 3 frames per second. Okay. Not faster than that. The other system can go like 15 frames and okay. still a lot slower than like microscopes which, are, which you can operate in streaming like you know, 90 to 100 frames per second. But this is typically 3 frames per second. Okay. And that's actually one other difference between like standard microscopy or confocal microscopy and this because in this case it's going to be like slower as compared to actually like extract more information. There are applications that you better do on a standard microscope, confocal microscope, like the calcium assay for instance. It's better to run it on the other one. But in this case, for instance, you can go, uh, yeah, the fastest one I've done was really three frames per second and staying in the same position. Ah, not changing. No, if, if you have only three like three frames per second, okay. then by the time you go in, you come back. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's a different application. Okay. Right. But this is like cell motility, so therefore okay. you repeat it every 10 minutes or half an hour. So that's the uh, summary of Putinamo uh, Global Solution. So we have the operator system that we have here for everyone. Uh, so there's a very good image quality here. Uh, the harmony software is really flexible, so actually. Elena knows how to take images already. We started this morning at 9 o'clock, and now she's an expert <laughs> on analysis. Um, we have the live cell capability here, so for you guys to know. And uh, we are, as I already said, implementing new futures. Right? Um, the Opera Phoenix is really like the latest, uh, that's a gold standard actually of, of the technology HCS, uh, with different number of cameras, uh, different excitation, and the synchrony optics. This is just the uh, technology we have launched. Columbus, this is the next step because you have to think about data storage. 
you have two terabytes in the computer process, but if you do live set imaging, every image is three is, uh, 2.5 megabytes per image per channel. So if you do like a measurement like we did this morning, we are probably at 300 megs for every single experiment. Right. So if you multiply it by number of channels, by number of planes, because you can do it also in 3D, and by number of time points, by number of planes, then you see. So that's the, the, your, your next question will be data storage and data management. So Columbus is one of them. The other one is just to buy your own storage if you have it here. And Velocity is a for 3D image. Uh, some automation is actually also possible if you want to add like a stacker using robots here. That's also something you can do. But the most important part is really this part here, image analysis and also the example of uh, analysis. So what we do now, more and more we see an analysis which is based on uh, advanced features like texture or star morphology. Uh, that's what we actually typically do here. So texture really helps moving beyond um, morphology and intensity parameters that we know. Uh, the star is actually an other uh, future, and phenology is this machine learning, so teaching the software to recognize the phenotype of interest. And then doing it. Lastly, this is bringing me to the last part of the talk, which is just some examples of my applications. So I have here a list of non uh, exhaustive uh, applications here uh, cell morphology, uh, uh, nuclear morphology. Uh, we have here something like on a uh, yeah, host uh, pathogen infection, so for infectious diseases, uh, have it here, uh, whole cell fluorescence, or any compound moving from one compartment to the other one from the cell. So we can uh, actually also measure translocation uh, or any uh, expression of protein. Right? We also make application notes that you can find in the internet. I'll give you the web page. It's uh, cellreimaging.com. Uh, so this is just like the list of some of them. We have 125. So and we just give a new one. But the one I want to choose here is the mind to tip index. Uh, and the reason why I use this one is because it's texture based. So to show you the difference between texture and intensity. So for analysis we know intensity, we know morphology properties, and texture is another dimension that you can use on top or you can also use it alone. And it also looks nice. And I'll try to explain it here. So what is texture, right? If you look at these two images here, so we have cap the couple and tau, they look pretty similar. When you do intensity, right? When you do morphology, they are exactly the same. You don't see any difference. If you look at the intensity, you will not see a big difference. This one will be lower intensity, but this one actually you will not see a very much uh, difference. But if you look at the texture, and that's what we recognize in our eyes. That is so obvious. So how the texture works is if you take this image, you zoom in this cell, which is here, and then you plot the intensity in Z, you have a kind of uh, landscape and of the intensity. And what the texture will do is it will just look across a group of pixels, which is called the state here. You can define the state in the software, and it will look at the distribution of the intensity. We have that spot distribution, we have all, we have the ridge of mountain, we have the valley. Right? And this is what the system will look at. If you apply this concept on a, like the same example that we did this morning, so PLA cells are staying with Dabi and uh, Tibulin for this type of skeleton, and then you look at untreated cells versus cells which are treated uh, with uh, genicosine. So genicosine is just acting on the uh, type of skeleton. If you look at these two cells here, you see that this is a normal phenotype, this one also, and this is kind of Intermediate, but not normal. So if you apply the texture and you look at the bridge, so here you will see lines, and in this one the lines will disappear. In contrast, if you look at the spot here, you will have a high spot, and this one the spot will be very good. So it's a very easy way to classify yourself. But more important even is usually in one image you have cells at different levels. Cells which are like in, in this uh, case, for instance, 68 and 47, they are very similar. But very different to cell number 55, which is going into my notes. So your image is not a very even population. Usually it's self and you. So in this case, you just look at the occurrence of the SDR bridge. So that's just the, uh, like, okay. And then you typically see that this cell is very different to that one. And this one is very close to this one. 
you can just look at the photographs uh, of the virus, and then you will see it in a very easy way, and very reproducible. So all the applications in which you don't have like an increase, like significant increase, and you have to think about the plate level, where you have, for instance, let's say 100,000 cells. So you really need to have a very good minimum between the positive and negative. Right? So if all the applications work, intensity is not changing. Morph morphology is not really changing. But you see a new distribution or new phenotype this year. So we can combine these together with um, the machine learning. So there's one uh, option which is called the DNA classifier. So it's a supervised uh, machine learning. And in, in this case, the way it works is uh, we are still in the same software here, but in the image analysis, you have your sequence, your analysis sequence. For instance, you say find the clean, software we find the clean, find cytoplasm with analysis. Then you calculate intensity properties, morphology properties, like an area, for instance, here, and intensity here. And you calculate texture properties, this is what I showed before. Rich, valley, saddle, swap, and uh, host. And then you use this linear classifier. So typically here, we want to see uh, the multiple cells in this population. But now, at this step, for every single cell, we know intensity information, we know morphology uh, information, and we also know texture information. Now, if you choose the linear classifier, you will teach the software how to recognize these cells. So for instance, here you say you have two phenotypes, so phenotype A and phenotype B. Phenotype A is class A in green, and phenotype B is B in red. And then you just choose some examples, a few examples of A and few examples of B. This is a green circle here. This is A, take one, two, three, large one, small one, and we see the B. Right? If you don't have enough object in A, uh, for B, for instance, and you have to look at here, this is well B15, you can move to a different value. And you take some more examples, one and two. This is well B19. And if you click next, the software will automatically classify these cells based on the properties which have been calculated before for each population. Right? And this is very, very also easy to use, so you create analysis very easy and based on the phenotype instead of looking at intensity and morphology. This is a different type of assay, cell migration. I don't know if you are interested, interested in this. Uh, 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 metastasis, for instance, all these kind of things. But cell migration, you can do it in 2D, but also in 3D. Now we have an application for that. Uh, using the particles technologies, uh, which is called OMIS, here. So the way it works is they have very special place with uh, stoppers. So at the beginning time zero, you are like here. You see the cells, you let them grow until they really cover the space here, and then you remove the stopper. And here you measure every, depending on the type of cell you have, every half an hour or every two hours. And then over like 28 or three days, and then you see how fast the cell will recover this empty space. And there are drugs which are stopping this or which are promoting this. So it's just on a per day basis. So this was at the very beginning when we didn't have the 2x objective. Now you can do this at 2x with only one image instead of six images here. Right. Just, just to show when you remove the, the support and after a few hours. So nice to know here is that you can reproduce the same experiment in bright view without any saying why before it was only possible in, in, uh, in GRSS. So in bright view, I just show here one image where you see the uh, empty space and the copper space. And now you can use the second part of this um, phenology, so the machine learning. So the way it works, you say here, I'm working in the bright field channel. I want to find the class. And you go in training mode, class A in green, and you just click on the image, right, to, uh, on, on the class you want to find. But because on this training region here, the texture is different in this area, Right. If you say next, then it just will tell you what is the part of the image with the similar texture. And I just put the uh, intensity image in the back so that you can see it very easily. Right? And there is a very good correlation between intensity uh, like fluorescence and gravity. And of course, recognize that this is really very good. And very easy analysis in three steps. I have some more examples in cancer biology, for instance. So it's a very big name. You can put whatever inside. Uh, 
but very rough example here, cell cycle, uh, signal molecular recruitment, uh, transcription uh, factor also. Well, let us say actually we can talk about the status skeleton and also the cell migration as I showed you. That's an example. Um, so for translocation, usually you have your dye, uh, for, let's say protein, which is tied with something, which is your cell, and then we just want to follow this protein uh, like over the time under different conditions. And the protein probably goes from the side of the road, for instance, to the nucleus, vice versa, or from membrane to nucleus. That's something we can do easily, even without specific membrane staining. Uh, so FKN is one example here. So you see the control, and you see what happens when you desaturate the system. Very simple. So you find yourself measuring intensity in the nucleus versus in the cytoplasm. You make a ratio. So you can do that. You can use the cytoplasm. And then uh, you just classify the cells based on the equation. So it's very simple. And here we just have like some uh, data um, using compound that we know the effect already. And then there's a very good correlation of what you have uh, compared to what uh, we are expecting. There's a ready made uh, analysis in which is already in the software. For cell cycle, usually uh, depending on how people uh, have done this, uh, the staining from the beginning, so you can do it with a special staining for each of the phases. It makes it much easier. And otherwise, if you don't have it, uh, just using single staining with that big instance, you can also do some cell cycle, which would look like what you're doing both sides of the It's a little bit different. Right. So G1S, usually G2, and Microbis. So that's this is what we did this point for the Okay. Uh, so typically here, uh, the software would just we look at the DNA content, so 2N, 4N, or both, chromosome, using the DNA intensity, total intensity. Uh, if we also look at the average intensity, taking the content uh, normalized by the area, so the cells after the mitosis will be much smaller, but we have seen 2N, so you can just put them in another class. And uh, cells uh, which cannot really uh, divide the DNA material will probably increase uh, the DNA content. But the best way I think to do it is really if you have, for instance, a staining for, uh, for mitosis, for instance, here, uh, that's something you can easily follow for S phase and for, uh, for the DNA content. So it makes your analysis much easier. And that's something you have to usually think about before you start. This is with only one staining, DNA, uh, for a copy, for instance, for DNA. So you have uh, three populations, so G1, G2N, and the S, which will be here. So that's something we can easily do. So we start the whole graph out. Oops, something is missing. Something is missing here. Uh, we're just uh, looking at the cell cycle, looking at the area of, uh, of the cell and the uh, uh, fragmentation of the DNA uh, using compound that we actually know. Uh, that's fine. So I'll skip this one. So for NF-kappa B, that's another example which is very similar to the FK dash one I've, I've shown before. That's the location of the uh, going between this, uh, from this condition to this one. So intensity measurement in different compartments, the ratio, increase from the cytoplasm, is very simple. Okay. Uh, so for apoptosis, we have different examples here. Looking at this uh, nuclear fragmentation, so you can see that between this step here and this one, in this one, your DNA will be more like, it's a late phase, but your DNA will be kind of fragmented. So your the coefficient of variance will be much higher here. Uh, this one is like a, a subnormal condition, and this one is normal condition. That's something you can do. The other one is cascade, something you can add, and then do the staining. It's yes, no. Cells will be stained uh, when they go in a uh, uh, dosis. The other one is NFC5. There's another thing which also works pretty nicely in a very early uh, phase of this. Um, so in this case, for instance, when you look at the, uh, uh, the three examples here, control for normal condition, uh, quite high concentration of, of, of storage green here, and very high. So you see there's different uh, phenotype here. And I could, ask, I could, for instance, do the analysis here using the same method with the machine learning. So I just come here, click on the flag four cells in the first condition, and then take four cells in the last condition here, and call this class is um, like normal, this one is like necrotic or autotic, and then it's a part of the table. That's pretty easy. Okay, uh, so in 
this case, uh, graphite was used for nuclear staining. So graphite is a very nice thing because you can use it for nuclear detection, but also sandy bottom detection. And it's in the car. But it's more toxic than the fish. It's not compatible with the fire cell. What is it? Uh, it's the RNA. Uh, RNA, yeah. So it's general RNA that. Yeah. So that's why you have it in both compartments. But it's, uh, so the only problem is it's more expensive and it's hardly compatible with life solution. But it works quite nicely. And very good to combine with Q. Okay. Um, so this is just like validation using the same as the screen here. So if you look at the uh, positive uh, cells like this, and you can correlate this one with this one, actually. Or if you look at the fragmentation, then it would be, uh, sorry, this is the, uh, the area, like this. So this case three is very simple because you say it's not safe. Uh, this is like looking at mitochondrial mass. That's another technique. If you have microscopic, for instance, uh, that's a very good example. And this is another example where texture-based uh, detection is very, very important. So typically, what happens here is if you look at the intensity mean, you have a difference between this one and the three others. But it's hardly possible to discriminate this tree. Right? Because the total intensity will not change for the cell. But what will change? You may get the distribution. In one, field, in one case here, you have a normal field type. It's a uh, mitochondria going along these microtubules, so concentrated and well distributed. And in this one, they are concentrated like next to the nucleus, can be the country, but can also be the cells is like time. But it's very difficult to see the differences between these three. Right. That's actually a technique where texture will definitely help. So for mitochondria, what we can do here, for instance, we can just look at the uh, cell count. So if I have less cells, then less toxicity. Because during your measurement, we say for every single well, I'm taking nine feet prices. So the area you measure for well will be roughly the same. Right? But provided that your cell distribution is even, and if you have less cells in one well, then you can say that probably there is some toxicity of the compound or treatment. But that's something you have to validate. We spoke about it this morning. So the very easy way to do cell uh, that cell toxicity is just to count cells, cell count. And then you see that with different compounds, when you increase concentration, then your cell number will go down. Another way is to look at this. So we are adding on top of the cell counting, we have some more parameters here. So for instance, the cell area. So let's say when the cell before, before is dying, so it will probably shrink, and then for you, it will go down. But you see here what happens uh, with this compound here, AAP, this one. What happens is, at some point, the cell will like that, to get into the fuse. So instead of going down here, the area go, goes up, and then at some point, they start to basically shrink. So you cannot just typically use only one parameter, like I said earlier. So that was what I want to do. Uh, this is the intensity, nucleus intensity. So when they get like uh, smaller and more dense, so the intensity usually goes to the intensity. But that's something you still have to uh, take care of. There is another staining, uh, Bobo 3, for membrane permeability, something you can also use. Um, just to say, for instance, that uh, cell respiration or you know, if there's any time, then and this, uh, this, this potential is not uh, like disrupted. It's something you can also use. Um, and but this one is it's actually much uh, it's more common to look at mitochondria Okay. So, and for mitochondria, I'll just show you the same example here, like different uh, situations in which you have like. Uh, but the big difference between here and the others, but between these three, it's more difficult. If you look at the texture, and something you can even not detect with your eye, the software will tell you that you have a very good correlation with this one here, just using texture and, and microcontrol thing, because it used the uh, SDR average parameter. And sometimes the variation is very, very small. You see here 0 0.001, 0 0.002, 0 0.002, 0 0.002, 0 0.002, 0 0.002, 0 0.002, 0 0.002, 0 0.002, 0 0.002, 0 0.002, Reproducible and based on the content. Um, yeah, this one to compare intensity and texture. So, of course, you can use them together, you can use texture only, 
and there are also applications where you don't have to they, they should because they should get small processes to calculation is more when you work inspection. So last example, I will not cover it. It's just good that you know that we also see it more and more. It's like all organism. Uh, and um, it's, now it's almost like 50 50 percent. So all the polygen labs actually for new application we are really looking at this. Uh, and this, this is a zebra fish model. Uh, uh, you also have like see uh, against it more and more, but also uh, umbrella bodies. Um, so it's more like 3D model because it's more uh, close to what we have in physiological uh, conditions. Um, so this is my last slide, or for last slide, just to confirm the tendency that we have now. So at the beginning, 2005, it was almost here, more than here, uh, and when I say here is a standing. Uh, and then after some, like 2009, we started to see this uh, in EHGS. It was already the case in microscopy, but in EHGS, uh, like stem cells application. So models which are more difficult. So this very simple example here, you have cells, uh, stem cells which are growing on top of feeders. And the feeder cell, actually, if you stay in the clay, you get the nuclei of the stem cells, but also of the feeder. And at the very beginning, you have to basically discriminate these two when you do the segmentation. And how you do it? Texture. Because the model there, uh, like the field, we have a different texture compared to the other. And we did the same thing like this five different cell lines, which we were able to basically discriminate just looking at texture of each cell line. Right. So it's very, very nice and very promising. You have here uh, like different types of stem cells. Um, and then you have to basically identify these cells here or the one which are. Uh, so a bright body, I already mentioned it, and the zebra fish has now the new answer that we see in the field. Yeah, so we develop tools that help researchers to identify the candidates for faster and reliable as we really want to about what we are aiming to do. So Okinawa uh, has a system which was called Opera, which is coming from Evotech. So Evotech is cool by Okinawa. And Opera has a system 18 years. And uh, the old one, and now the new one, which I showed, was just launched like last year. And um, on top of that, we have the other one. So that's a very, um, I think, you know, we are offering like, a very good uh, crowd solution for, for, for imaging. So on top of that, we have the Acapella and Harmony, that's for the analysis, which you can also use on your microscope images. So we're using like machine learning on your microscope, uh, like uh, uh, images. We have the Columbus, which I already showed before. And um, so you can also use this technology for assay development, but also like conventional biology. Because you have more and uh, better reproducibility. Uh, your productivity will be increased. So the number of publications, for instance, using this number is like uh, exponential. And the first paper on your crop, for instance, was, uh, was last month, after six months. Um, so how many actually implement like new uh, features every year? Set. And our install base is actually just growing, especially for infectious diseases, because we have labs like the uh, Pasteur Institute, for instance, in Paris, in Lille, in South Korea, you know, they are all equipped. Uh, there is one in Tunisia, actually, which is going to be equipped also pretty soon. Uh, for malaria, so there is the BPFC, uh, and HAC in Holland, uh, we, uh, we have a little good school of tropical medicine, they are also equipped. And, also and the reason why they really like it is because of the, um, the like object based segmentation and the penetration. So that's something I'm very happy to look at here. With that, I think I'm um, just going to end up here. So that was basically what I wanted to talk about. I think time was okay. So uh, if you have any comment or whatever you
want to make it too long, that's why, uh, but I just I can show you. I mean, I have some examples uh, with these micro tissues, for instance. Uh, the umbrella way I showed before was, was also done on, uh, so you see from these two models, actually, they're also in here. We have a new application node, which is, uh, let me check something. Just for the list, I'll not go through it because it will be too long. But if you, if you want, I can, I can, I can show you more than this perception. That's the one, that's the presentation I did in, um, in Pasta. Uh, so yeah, but definitely, I mean, there, are, there are more and more examples. Going to, uh, you see, this is a 3D model. It's like 2D, but which we, for which we did a, um, a biocanalic video. That's a new application mode. But the reason why I didn't want to show is because, because this was done on the, uh, on the other system. You know, the biocanalic uh, video. Something we basically, we basically, we basically use. It's a real 3D model. Uh, there's also another thing in um, cardiac diseases. You know, just measuring like hundreds all the time. That's something we, we also we, we also do. But this is this is a completely different treatment, model, which works quite nicely. But you are totally right that the uh, that's a tendency. I mean, now in most of the uh, like the new demonstration I'm doing now, you, it, they all include treatment. Model. Sure. Uh, another question: uh, There is a concern about the phototoxicity mm -hmm. of orthogonal microscopes mm -hmm. uh, to these uh, live. So, so for Aperita, so I have said that you have like confocal and wide field, right? So, so in, in, if you work in confocal, so 3D normally you typically work in, in confocal, you know, to have like a spinning disc. Yeah. yeah. So the technology we use is a, is a spinning disc, and if you look at the three technologies which are available for confocal, so you have the two point, you have the line scanning, and you have the spinning disc, and spinning disc is the less toxic, right? That's the yeah. one which is why it is, that's one we use. Now, there is one difference between the operetta and the opera. So in opera, the spinning disc has, is a double disc, you know, the uh, Yokogawa system. And the one now we have is our own uh, double disc. One disc has micro lenses, and the micro lens will focus the light through the big holes. But on the operetta, we have single disc. And single disc actually needs actually more light input. Right? It's not a laser excitation, and you also have to see the difference because there's one system with lasers, for lasers, you have double disc, so that's why the price is like uh, like four times higher than the other one, right? But an operator, the opera, did you mention the opera? Is there a lot of things in the operator, but not the opera? Uh, it's the same system. So opera is old. We stopped it now. We like this one, the last opera. The old. Yeah, we call it opera. But the, the new one is called Opera Phoenix. Ah, I see. Yeah. So the old one was like the, uh, was in the market for more than, and they are simple. So the first one was sold in DSA in Madrid, and they are still using it. Number, like number two machine or one, and they are still using it. Uh, but that was the old one. It was made by Evotech, and Evotech actually were using uh, like a difficult software, which is called Opera. And what we wanted to do was to use, like, the way our focus is the same, uh, the concept of this multiple camera is the same, but the screen disk we have now, let me suppose what I'm showing you. The screen disk technology that we have is something completely different. I don't want to make it too long, that's why I just keep on this 3D stuff, because for me it will be more interesting for you guys to see. You see here now, that's the... Uh, this should very quickly, you don't want to, to go through it. You see, on, on the whole system, uh, if for instance you have a, system, uh, a measurement with uh, DAPI and RSA for a date, you want to do it in parallel, you can do it. For all organization are safer, so it's better to excite the two growth at the same time and do it in this cycle. Right, so that really gives you uh, real time uh, results. But on the previous system, because TAPI has a very wide emission, see, so if you combine the TAPI and the, uh, this is the TAPI image and the GFP, so you also get part of this TAPI leading to the other channel. That's what happened in the whole program. And here, they just show the spinning disk, so the holes which are on the spinning disk, which let basically the green and the blue lasers go in top of channel. Now this is the Phoenix, um, and this this is the Yokogawa, the, uh, the double disk, the spinning disk from Yokogawa, right? 
So now the screen, in the new screen is we have like more holes. Um, the distance between the pin holes actually is also um, how to say optimized to reduce the need to, to the crosswalk between the pin holes. And what we have here, so you have different configuration. This is with only one camera. So with one camera you don't have a problem. You have to excite the first channel and then move filters, excite the second channel. But you see here we have eight uh, four lasers, for instance, four oh five uh, for eight, eight, five, sixty one, six forty. And they are grouped like two by two, four oh five is five sixty one and four eight eight is six forty. But it's, it, it becomes interesting when you have two cameras. So because the 405 will go through pinholes, which are not the same as the other one. Right? With two cameras, or with four cameras. So if you have four cameras, they could just put the speed uh, here to uh, take uh, the uh, long wavelength here, and then the short wavelength will go to one and three. And this is a very nice stuff because um, if you have the same situation with Tapi and ISR together, then you can get a separation. And there's a new set of laser for people who are doing FRAP, but this is how we call it FRAP opera. So that's what happened, right? And this is, um, that's, a, that's a unit technology is called synchrony optics, with a back end, which is basically using here. But, and for, for, for the 3D models, um, um, yeah, just here we have a water immersion lenses. So it's a lens, uh, is, uh, we use water instead of oil. The oil is not compatible with the GS and automatic imaging. Uh, that's the water is coming from the top here, and then you, the plate is coming here. So during all the measurement, you have a very good um, how to say resolution and very low well background due to this uh, very well which are pretty nice. Right? And on this system, you have six objectives, so three dry and three wet, right, which are very well done. Uh, but I'll just skip this part because this is something that it, that's called the alignment, an automatic alignment process, so you don't have to worry about references or the, everything is done uh, automatically. But that's a good point. I mean, it's, um, yeah. So for 3D models, we have like, and that's why we have like both our new application, um, both our new application are uh, basically related to, uh, to 3D. So, I don't know if you are familiar with this InSphere uh, technology. There's one which is made by uh, Garbage in Plus, you know, it's called uh, InSphere. So, they make like droplets. So, you can do it like manually. Thank you. 
do the forest surface marker and then uh, uh, fix them and scan them with this microscope. And then I, get, I can use this software to analyze the number of cells, the cell phase, and also the number of processes you see. You can look at your eyes, uh, number of branches, number of nodes. And this is done automatically. You have to basically set up, define this protocol. Mm -hmm. And especially for your eye outgrowth. There is a very good benefit here. So, for instance, I have a uh, customer who uh, is working on primary uh, churches, and uh, so basically he's only with a map staining and a VM, and he's only looking at this uh, synapses in uh, mirrors which are not here. So, in this case, you have to first find all the nuclei, find the cell bodies, mm -hmm. say this cell body is mature or not, and then trace the neurons, like the uh, linear eyes. Expand the device, find the spots inside, classify the spot, this is a good spot, this is not a good spot, and then make the decision at the end. And you can also trace even not in here because we don't have a bell here, because I have, have written a script for that, which can also trace the device which are not attached to cell bodies in the image. And it is easy to use, I mean, I can. Easy to use, yeah. It's, I always say it's easy to use, but no, it's, it's really easy to use. The thing is, it, once the protocol exists in the system, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So I'll show you one or two parameters that you have to change. It's usually the difference between the direct and the background. That's something. But the concept is, is, is very easy to, to get. And I don't know what uh, I don't know this. This morning, so far, so good. <laughs> yeah, so that's it with the direct outlook is one application. And there is an application mode. And an application mode, maybe the mode. But there is a really nice solution. Yeah, if you have any other questions.